Okay, hi. I am François René Rideau, and today we are going to climb up the semantic tower at runtime with first class implementations. So my take home points are that you should you can and should reason about implementations and that the correct tool for that is category theory. And then I will use the Curry Howard isomorphism to extract a first class protocol for implementations, which is a very practical protocol. So I will go from the abstract to the concrete using Curry Howard. Then I will present you how we can use these uh, things to do migration and more. And my end game is that I want to reconcile runtime reflection and static semantics. Static semantics is when you know everything about the program before you run it. Runtime reflection is when you can change what the program means while it's running. And I want both, and I will have both. The advancement status is that I have finally finished writing my PhD thesis after 20 years. In my copious free time as a founder of a startup, I'm building a proof of concept in Scheme. And I'm trying to get language implementers on board, and that means you. Because even if you write a simple program, this program is actually a language for the user to use. So every program is a language. Every programmer is a programming language implementer. And so you can all benefit from this. And so the fourth step is profit, which means um, that what I'm going to provide you today is a point of view. It's more of a research and development program than uh, a tool toolkit you can use. But it's a mental toolkit. OK, formalizing implementation. What are implementations? Let's say you have a program, my program, the best program in the universe. And what you have, unhappily, is a, a PC, which is not the best machine in the universe. But conceivably not, at least. And you want to run it, so you need an implementation. So an implementation will be some arrow there that says that what I have written in x86 actually corresponds to, uh, to something in the abstract uh, for my program. And of course, I don't want to write my program in x86 binary or assembly or anything like that. I want to write my program in the best possible programming language, which is, of course, Lisp. So, but I have a PC and I wrote my program in Lisp. How do I run it? Well, happily, Lisp has an implementation on the x86. Everything's fine. And actually, my program is a certain version in, in the repository. And Common Lisp is actually this version of Common Lisp, uh, everything. And Common Lisp is hard to, to implement, so it has a few passes of intermediate representation in the middle. Of course, I write my program in Lisp because I write my program in a DSL. Everyone wants, wants to write the program in the best possible language for the problem, which is a DSL, that you then implement in Lisp, the best language to implement a DSL in. And then, of course, x86 is just a virtualized PC, the, the real PC is somewhere underneath. And under the PC, there is lots of things and level of physics, but usually we'll stop at, at the level of software. But there is no button. You can always go deeper. And there's also no uh, fixed level. You can al always introduce finer divisions, finer uh, intermediate representation and passes. So this thing I call the semantic tower. And most people, the way they use their se semantic tower, they write the program at the top. So the program is not this layer. The program is actually the implementation here. They, wrote the pro they write the program, uh, and then they compile it, they compile it, and then they run it. And that's all they can do. The semantic tower is a one way. You go down and you run. And I, that's not what I want. What I want is to be able to go down and up. And we'll see. So let's go implementation informally. An implementation relates to computations. So what I have this, each of these, each of the, the, the names, the big names in like my prog or DSL or, or computation. and the thing in between are the implementations. My implementation will relate to computations. I will have to speak uh, often of very specific implementations because you can't say just common list. We have to say this very particular version of common list compiled with this particular option and this particular machine, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to hold, a, a, to hold together these towers of computations. And I want to reason about them. I will have basic correctness properties, and I will have other useful properties. So first challenge is all these computations are usually not very adequately formalized. Oh, the implementation is a specification, and uh, it's written in a language uh, that itself has no specification except the, the compiler that was handed you by the vendor. 
And sometimes they have like specification, oh, this is the uh, denotational semantics of it, or uh, label transition system for it. And all these formalisms are incompatible. And only when we have unified these formalisms, we can start talking about the implementation. So here are a few formalisms. You may or may not be fa familiar with them. Uh, you don't have to be, just to tell you that there are a lot of them. Category theory can unify all of them. What is category theory? It's universal because it can represent graphs, pre-orders, label transition system, operational semantics, e everything you want. And it's universal because it has a simple core and unlimited abstraction. The simple core just nodes and arrows. If you have even ever written a diagram with nodes and arrows, this is category theory. And it has structure preservation. You can compose your arrows. And the structure, the way you preserve this composition of structure makes uh, everything about category theory. It has unlimited abstraction. You have a category, you can have categories of categories, etc. categories of functors, categories of everything you want. And you get lots of structural theorems for free. Category theory looks at the plumbing, at the, the shape of your diagrams. It doesn't care what's at, uh, inside the, the nodes. But just looking at the plumbing, you get theorems for free. And an interesting thing you get is a Curry-Howard isomorphism. An isomorphism between your types and your uh, propositions and between your programs and your proofs. And you can go from one to the other. And I will use that. And if I had to categorize category theory, I would say it's about seeking the essential. While people who do set theory or all kinds of low-level things have lots of puns, because the encoding, the way they encode their problem in their particular substrate means there are lots of puns and uh, things that mean the same thing incidentally. Category theory is about removing anything that's inc incidental and focusing on the essential. Here are some notation. I will write that, hey, this is an object in some category C, and another object in some category C, and this is a functor of uh, a morphism from the object X to Y. I will say node and arrow instead of objects and morphisms. Uh, it's uh, more informal. So here's a, an element. Uh, let's assume that this object can be seen as a set, an element in a set, and to this element, I associate a value uh, through this function phi. And here's a, a, mo a morphism, uh, an, an arrow that is injective. So it goes from x to y, and I, I add this extra row to see this injective. And here's an arrow that is not a total function. So hey, category series, I dash it because, whoa, this is not your usual grandma's total function. So here's computation as categories. My nodes are the states of my computation, and the arrows are the transition between states. So I will write something like that. I write x is a node, and y is a node in, in this category s, and there is a transition from x to y. And there's also a transition from y to z where it's a subset SE of uh, the category S that has some special effects. And I will denote F, the effect, to distinguish this effect from other effects that may, may be happening. So there may be multiple arrows between two nodes that correspond to different side effects, for instance. And here's an example. Here's some, a PostScript program. And the PostScript program has a continuation that says, first I will uh, put uh, the string hello on the stack, and they will, then I will show it. There is a transition here that says, oh, now I have hello on the stack. Here there is an empty stack. Now I have hello on the stack, and my continuation is to show it. And here, hop, I uh, output hello as a, as a side effect in a subset uh, PostScript output of PostScript. And now my continuation is the empty program. I'm done. So here's what uh, computation looks like in this um, formalism. And the con convention, computation progresses from left to right. Your left to your right. And uh, the effect uh, label is above. And the category or subset of category is below, whatever. Uh, this is abstract interpretation. You all know and love abstract interpretation. You have a concrete system C. And you have an abstract system A. And you have some kind of interpretation phi here. And it's partial. Not every, not every object has a proper type. Not every object has a, uh, an abstraction that corresponds to it. Here is what I'm interested in. Not abstract interpretation is concrete implementation. You have an abstract system A, you have a concrete system C, you have a partial uh, um, function from uh, C to A that preserves the structure, but I'm going to um, morally consider it the other way from A to C. It's the same, the same definition, the same constraints, but morally I'm going to go from abstract to concrete. And that changes everything because I will, I will not be able to abstract the, the dynamic context because I'm, when I go from, uh, from abstract to, to, co to concrete, I can't forget anything. I must remember all the details. I will uh, be able 
So denotational semantics will be slightly problematic. We can deal with it, but slightly problematic. What we'll deal with is more like operational semantics. Since we go from the down instead of up, we go from towards the concrete rather than towards the abstract. We also co-functorial co structure preservation goes from concrete to abstract, but I will go against the structure preservation. I will be noisy versus uh, lossy. When you have a total function, it loses information. When I go down against a total function, I add information. I will add implementation details. I will add to my object graph a label that says, hey, this is the address at which this object is. I will add information details. And of course, this is not deterministic. There are many possible ways I could allocate my memory. This is non-deterministic, whereas when you go from the concrete to, ab to the abstract, it's deterministic. So it's the same diagram, but you look at it in a different way, and things change tremendously. Here's partiality, uh, justification of partiality. Here's a, a C-like language uh, on top, and here is a postscript, or to represent a stack-like language on, at the bottom. And the C-like language first prints hell, and then it prints O. Oh, it's better here. And the concrete postscript first puts hello on the stack and uh, then prints it. And morally, at the end, at the beginning and at the end, this is the same program. It's a program that at first hasn't printed anything, and at the end has printed hello. And if you don't care about intermediate steps, one program implements the other. That's fine. But look, this state here has no thing that represents it below, and this state here has nothing that it uh, interprets into above. So it's important to have partiality. I want to be able to represent transitions where system that have uh, local, like the implementation can locally break invariants, can locally do things that do not have a meaning uh, up there. And when I will interrupt my program, it will have no meaning until I somehow find a meaning, find a meaning to it. Partial functions. I will write my partial functions like this with a dashed ar uh, arrow that says, hey, category theorist, this is not a total function. And a category theorist, OK, so what, what do you mean exactly by partial function? Well, what I mean by a partial function is I have a subset O of C. So let's see, C is my concrete system. O will be the subset of observable nodes in my concrete system. And it will be a full subcategory if you're a categorist. And then I, ha I will have a regular functor from O to A. And that's what I mean by a partial function. So then I can write, hey, here's the introduction diagram for my partial function. If I have what's on the left, I have what is on the right. That's my introduction diagram for partial functions, partial functors in this case. And because I will have lots of introductory diagrams like this, I will write them like that instead. If I have what's in black, then I have what's in blue. So this means, hey, if I have this observable subset of, of C and blah, 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 and it's uh, injective, then, yep, everything's fine. And this is the same diagram, but point-wise. Now, A is an element of big A, and C is an element of big C, and O is an element of big O. And what does it mean for, uh, o, for J to associate O to C? Well, uh, C to O, uh, it's, an it's, a, it's an injection, it's a canonical injection, where it means that O equals C. That means it's the same element, but considered from a subset of, of the other. OK, properties of implementation. Here's the main property you want every implementation implementation to have. If you don't have this property, it doesn't even qualify as an implementation. What does it mean? Let's read this diagram. It means that if I'm starting from A, an abstract state, and I represent it as C, a concrete state, and I, have, I start computing in the concrete, and at some point I have an answer that may be the final answer or an intermediate answer, but it tells me, hey, the, this uh, is an arrow from C to C prime and has this effect. And I can observe it, it as A prime. Then the main essential property I want for my implementation is that I can make this diagram commute. I can find a, a, an arrow from A to A prime that makes this diagram commute. And what does it mean that if I'm giving you the answer to the concrete, this answer actually has a meaning in the abstract. I'm not going to lie to you. If the concrete implementation tells you uh, there is a path from here to there, then yes, there is a path from here to there. If not, you can throw away your, your implementation to the garbage bin. It's not worth it. But if you're a category series, you'll say, hey, I know this diagram. What is this diagram? It's just phi being a functor. So I've already justified why category theory is a, is, a good, um, is a good formalism, because the one thing you get for free by being a category is, is exactly the one thing that you want every implementation to have. So uh, I already won. I already justified category theory. OK, here's totality. Here's a property that I do not want every implementation to have. It's the property that if I have an abstract uh, node A, 
then I can implement it as a uh, concrete node C. And why do I not want it? Because sometimes I like uh, infinite calculi, such as the lambda calculus. And sometimes, at least all the time, I have a finite computer, which is my PC. And I want to implement the lambda calculus in my PC, but I will not be able to fit it all. So by definition, I want my implementation to not be total. But maybe in my tower of semantics, I can say, hey, this is the only step that's not total. That's the one that does memory allocation. So as long as I don't get uh, out of memory error, then my thing will be total. And maybe I can otherwise prove that I will get an out of memory error. But I, st I can still usefully think about the totality even if my uh, implementation is not total. But here's the case. Soundness, everyone needs to have it. All the other uh, properties are optional. Completeness. Completeness is, means if I have this diagram, which means uh, I start from A, A, and I can implement it as C. And I want to go to A prime. That's where I want to go in the abstract. Well, I can force my uh, concrete implementation to do it. So I can start from this diagram and get that diagram. That's, I call that completeness. And in label transition system, they call that a simulation. So it's, a, it's not that original uh, something. Here's advanced preservation. It, suppose there is a subset A plus and a subset C plus of A and C respectively for strictly advancing computations. That means if I'm not stuck in the abstract, then I'm not studying the concrete, and I, I may not read the same, uh, the same um, place because I can advance more steps or fewer steps than a, a second. And if there are non-determinic choices, I don't need to make the same choices. But if I'm not stuck in the abstract, I will not be stuck in the concrete. Here is liveness. It means if I make enough progress in the concrete, then I will have made some progress in the abstract. So I can just keep computing, keep putting the concrete, and yes, I will make progress, liveness. And all these properties are composable. That's very important. If you want to, to reason piecewise about uh, your, your tower of implementation, you don't want to have a huge, gigantic formula from uh, Haskell to, uh, to uh, assembly. No, you want to reason about each step separately and, and have your property. And so you can in introduce intermediate steps and reason about each step, and you have your property for the whole thing. Or you can. Uh, have your thing already done and add a step on the top. And since you already proved your property for your ab abstract system, for your program, you just need to prove the property for your program. Or you can prove it for, uh, you have it for a system and you want to add a virtual machine or virtual implementation underneath, and et cetera. So that's composability, you can see it many ways. Here, a property that unhappily is not composable. It's observability. It's the property that I'm proposing is neglected by everyone and that's the one contribution of my thesis. It means if I have this diagram here, I'm, I'm starting from the abstract, I, I implement it and I run. Then I interrupt it because I want to interrupt my program at some point to observe it. But I can't observe it. Why can't I observe it? Because these implementations are partial functors. So when you interrupt in the middle, the invariants are broken. Nothing means anything. The, the heap is in the middle of being written to. It's, uh, you have uninitialized pointers on the heap. Uh, there's a log that's being held. Your two resources are out of things that don't everything goes wrong, I can't observe the thing, I can't give you a meaning. So your debugger tells you, hey, hey, here's this 64-bit value in register or, or AX. So what? I can't observe it. So to observe it, I first need to synchronize to a save point. And the save point will be called C second, and I will be able to synchronize to it using a subset CS of stabilizing computation of, of the category C. And it will be a subset that typically is guaranteed to take less than one microsecond and do no input output or something like that. So I can run it from my uh, interrupt handler. And then I can uh, observe my thing uh, with a, a second. Yay! What does that mean? That and now I, I don't need to go just down the semantic tower. Now I can go back up. Very important. It changes to everything. And there's a very art good article by Alan Bowden and PC Losering that describes that on, in ITS in the 60s uh, for the operating system. You could never catch a process with its pens down. It was always outside of, system, uh, of a system call. Problem, of course, it's not composable. I told you that. Why is it not composable? Because, hey, I implement P through A, A to C. I run to C prime. I go to C second. I get A seconds, A, A third, P third. What's missing is diagram? What's missing is diagram is C third here. So this is not, uh, this is not observability. I, I lose. I can't. I don't have observability. Or, 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 
have observability plus completeness because that diagram at the, it could be completed like this if I have the proper completeness between AS and CS. So here I have missing A, 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 C, C second, A second, A, A third. And here I create the C third using completeness. And now if I have observability plus completeness, the whole thing is composable, which means that now I can reason about piecewise piece to all my tower of semantics and have the ability to go back up using observability. Okay, first class implementation. This is all theoretical. This is just things on paper and diagrams on paper. What can I do with it? Well, there's this cool thing called the Curry-Howard isomorphism that tells you that if you have this diagram that or can be translated into a logical property, you can extract from this logical property a computational content. How do we do that? Here's a category in Agda. A category is a set where you have this field, the uh, object, which is a set, uh, really, uh, the arrows, which is the relations between the object, the binary relation, for every, hour, uh, for every element of the set, uh, here uh, the, the curly braces means it's an implicit argument that you can, you don't have to specify in practice because it can be inferred. Um, for every element of the set, you have an arrow from itself to itself, and you can compose arrows if the codomain of, domain of one, codomain of one is the domain of the other. And you have other properties in Agda that says uh, this thing is associative and ID is the neutral element, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a con computational content. And when we try to express it in, Agd uh, in Haskell, say, we can write this. Hey, a category S is a class where I have another set arrow of S or S. And there is a domain that goes from RS to S, the codomain from RS to S, the identity arrow from S to an arrow of S, and I can compose my arrows. Oh, 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 and why do I have a dashed thing here? Because composition of arrows is total when you have the proper uh, dependent types. But composition of arrows is not total from an arrow of, of things that don't match. So oh, I already have partiality here. So when I, I drop my dependent types, I have to add partiality, or I have to add something. I, I can't have anything. And you can express partiality as a monad or anything, but I will always write a dashed arrow when beware this is not a total function. So an operational semantics is a category such that I, have, I can run my, my, my thing. I can start from a point and I can run an uh, undetermined number of steps, which may, may be zero step or one, uh, 10 million steps. Run doesn't say how many steps it will run. Done would tell you, hey, am I done or not? Are we there yet? Advance will say, OK, I will advance some number of steps. I will make strict progress unless I'm done. I will not return until I have made at least some progress. And eval means, hey, I'm going to evaluate until I'm done. And maybe I will not terminate. So there is non-determinism, but there is also non-termination, where run has only um, non-determinism, non but not non-termination. It always terminates run. And here, advance may also always terminate, but eval may not terminate. OK, here's a protocol. Uh, what is an implementation? An implementation from A with C is just the interpretation function from C to A. And since I'm um, uh, functorial, I also have the interpret R from arrow of C of arrow of A. And uh, since it's partial functors, I, I need to dash them. And R is a pirate sound, because every category series is secretly a pirate. Totality, what the computational content of totality is just its function implement from A to C. And what totality says is this arrow happens to not be, um, uh, as happens to be total. Here it can still be non-deterministic, but it's total. So completeness means I have this implement R a function that takes this diagram and completes it there. And if I drop the uh, compile time information, I get this. What's the compile time information? Well, here in Agda, implement arrow will be for all C in CO and AA prime in AO. So A and pi can be implicit because they are given already by F. So uh, if I, the implicit arguments I can remove from, uh, from there. So implicit argument A, A prime, OK, I can remove them. So C and I keep. F, which is from arrow, uh, I need to keep. Phi, the fact that C goes, is mapped to A, I can drop. Uh, the fact that I have C prime, I can drop because I have the, this G. And this, I can drop its uh, property. So in the end, I, I get that. And my total arrows becomes uh, a non-total arrow because I'm using, because I'm dropping implicit arguments, and because I, it can be non-deterministic because I have a there exists. So there exists makes it non-deterministic, and the, the curlies here make it partial. Okay. 
Protocol liveness. Liveness, the same way. Uh, liveness is a protocol that takes C and will give you the arrow from C to C prime. So I want to advance in the abstract, but while remaining in the concrete. Don't, don't show me the abstract. Just guarantee that I will have made progress in the abstract. Observability, well, it means, uh, I mean, C prime gives me a, uh, a safe point, C second. Actually, you need to give me a safe point and the effects. I will, I will need to go to from C, C prime to C second. Or safe arrow, I have this arrow from C to C prime. Please give me the arrow from C to C second. May my arrow stable. Make my point stable safe or make my arrow safe. That's what the observability says. I can interrupt anywhere and make it safe to observe. OK, refined versus reflected ev evaluation. Now I, I showed you a protocol for implementing something in terms of something else. But at the bottom, what you want is being able to run it. To run it, and so you, you need this uh, function eval that will take the state and will return uh, the computation done. And the, the reified version takes the representation of the state and the representation of the input outputs and a new state. And the only effect there is non-determinism, actually also non-termination. And the reflected variant eval bang, it takes also a, an element f, it gives you a new state, and it does the thing. Which means that if you are uh, going to send the 1,000 Bitcoin or draw, launch a nuclear missile, the eval will say, hey, this program launches a nuclear missile. And this thing says, yes, launch the nuclear missile, nuke them. So there are two different uh, approaches to the, to the same thing, but uh, different uses. So runnable and observable protocol. I can go from the reified to the reflected by performing it. That is, I have a, a state. I transform it into a machine state. I have an abstract. Uh, uh, a representation of the computation and actually affect this computation from that state. And reification is going the opposite way, that's the thing that nobody has. So perform, you can always write your, your eval function, that's easy. Reification is hard. Reification says, I'm starting from this state and I want a representation of it. And I'm thinking about a state and a way to transform that state and I want an arrow that represents what this thing would do. So give me a program and give me uh, instructions for the program. Is this going to launch the missile or not? Because if it is going to, I probably don't want to do it. So simulate goes from the evaluation to the representation. And to get that, you need to implement the whole system. Whereas to, to write your eval function, anyone can write an eval function in any system. But writing the simulation, you can't write it without representing everything, and that's much harder. So what I have with my implementation protocol is that I can lift the evaluation protocol from the bottom to the top. So yes. Um, so this is Haskell, and AND means uh, apply the function to the, uh, to the right to the argument on the left. So I start from the node, I apply the function implement, and then the uh, uh, function c.perform, and I can uh, implement my thing and, and perform it. Uh, no, and perform it, I perform a point. So I go from the abstract to the concrete, and I go from the concrete to the machine. To perform an arrow, you go from, uh, at this point in the machine, you, you go back from the machine to the concrete representation. You implement your arrow with this diagram. So now you get here, and then you perform this arrow back to the machine level. So uh, I should have written a diagram. But let's forget about the specific diagrams of this thing. What I mean is that, you have, a, you have a implementation that is a mapping between the representations. And you have evaluation, which is a mapping between the representation and the actual machine. And you can lift the correspondence between the machine and the representation to the level you want. So if you know how to run your assembly program, and you know how to translate your abstract program into assembly, then you, you can run your abstract program. That's what it says. It also says that you can get the simulation for free if you have observability. Or you can lift simulation if you have observability here, safe arrow, and you can uh, lift, you need only need simulation to lift uh, performance, uh, whatever. Well. And here's uh, lifting running. To run from a node, I, I implement that node, I run the concrete, and I run it, and then I stabilize it with safe arrow, and I imp interpret my arrow in the, in the abstract. So, you can, you can lift your protocol using this thing. Semantic tell. What does that tell us about compilation? Well, compilation, you can say, have a naive view of compilation, have an abstract system, and I implemented your concrete system, and that's just an implementation. 
other view of compilation is actually have a source code, which is not the abstract system. The abstract system is an abstraction of it. I'm drawing to, to drop the line numbers, drop the labels, uh, apply some rewrites and optimizations, and blah, blah, blah. And this is my abstract thing. And then I'm going to, to compile it to, to machine code. So I'm going to abstract away the source code into the actual thing I care about. But as you may know, equality between two programs is undecidable. And my compiler is definitely a computable thing, or it better be. So my compiler will not be able to process A. What my compiler actually does is process U, a subset of understood program up to some semantics and up to allowed rewrites. That is what the compiler understands, which is much less than A. And the, 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 the gap, there is an irreducible gap, because here is understood is computable and A is not computable. So there's a gap. There will always be a gap. But I can always try to narrow the gap a bit or widen it. It, it depends. There is, there is some freedom here. Here's compilation. This compilation with types. Now I, I can go up to a system T that is a type. And T has subject reduction. There are no exomorphisms. There are no arrows from one element of T to another element of T. That is, when I'm, comp com when I'm inside the type and I'm computing, I will remain inside that type. Then that, let's call to that type. I'm in, always inside that type. And so I am in a pretty major of this. And then I will be able to compile with the knowledge that I'm inside that type. OK. Uh, here's a semantic tower. So my source code, I will interpret it into some level u, u2 here. And u is a subset of A, but I could have a subset with more equalities, more, more recognition of programs that are equal, or fewer optimizations. And I will select which level I am there. And I can also go down to more implementation details, or I can go up to ever more optimization, ever more abstraction. But I will have to pick a, a particular level. And with, in your traditional system, you pick that level, you, you put your compilation flags, you pick that level, and you run the program, and, and you go down, and, and that's it. But if you have observability, you can go back up. So I can go down to C2 and go back up to C1. But I don't have to follow the same path when I go back up and when I go back down. So now I don't have an implement or semantic tower. I have a semantic category. Yes? Explain observability. observability is you, in, you run your program, you, you start running it, and then you stop it, you, you go to a safe point, and then you can go back up in the semantic tower at runtime. You can uh, stop your program inside and looking at your program is assembly garbage, gobbledygook. You can look at your program in terms of, hey, here I have a stack of objects that are well formed in my type system on whatever. And here is the, the graph I'm trying to reduce. And you can see the graph you're trying to reduce, up to optimization that you have allowed the computer to, the compiler to do. Uh, if you have a very, very good debugger, it may be somewhat observable. Uh, but Stepping through step through yeah, if, if, so if you have, a, a, say, an interpreter with a very good debugger, then it's reasonably observable. But if you drop, if you examine your stack frames, but the, the debugger does not guarantee whether there's actually a value there and whether it makes sense, and uh, most debuggers don't actually observe at the real high level. They, they, they do it up to, well, we may, this value may, not, may or may not be there. Yeah, you want to recover the state of your program at the level of your source language or whatever intermediate language up to allowed rewrite because you allow the compiler to, the compiler to do rewrite. But up to this allowed rewrite, you get your program at the level of, of abstractions that you care for. You don't care about 64 bit integers in memory. There's an interpretation of the concrete. Yes. The yes. You interpret the concrete in terms of the abstract, and for that, you need to be at the safe point. If you're not at the safe point, there's no, no such thing. Yes. Yeah, I, I, actually, that is something I discussed soon. Uh, so the tower is not linear. Now, it's a, it's a category, which means that you can, say, focus on, on parallelism or, or concurrency, or focus on memory allocation, or focus on both, or focus on neither. And you can decide which aspects of the implementation you will or will not care about at runtime, when you are debugging or you're observing your program. And I can reinterpret aspect-oriented programming this way. Aspect of auto programming is compile time um, constraint metaprogramming. Of you have a, a program that has multiple aspects, you must find a joint program that has all the aspects. Alongside fault tolerance, I want to be able to synchronize to an, a 
a state that is observable all the way up so that I may kill my thread uh, while it's not holding locks and while it's not violating any invariance. Uh, refactoring, I will uh, try to change the program below without changing the abstract program above, et cetera, et cetera. So I can, uh, with diagrams like that, try to give a meaning, a formal meaning to many common things. Principal reflection, migration. <coughs> Here is observability followed by re-implementing a different way. So I start computing with a concrete implementation C. Uh, so actually, the implementation is five. C is a concrete system. And then I say, hey, what if I instead use Psi? And I compute with Psi. So I can start computing on my uh, cell phone and migrate my program to the desktop or to the cloud while it's running. I don't have to stop the program. The program is none the wiser. Or what can I do? Uh, I can do a lot of things. But some of you may say, hey, hey, what, this diagram is not well tied. Because, no, first, as I say, uh, I don't want to reify four gigabytes of memory and de reify them to do something. So what I want to do is actually have uh, some transformation here, M, so migration, that takes this state and give a new state in a new implementation. And this diagram does not type. Here I have uh, morphism. Here I have an association. Here I have a morphism in another category. What does it mean? The strong type is, ah! Well, <coughs> with dependent type, that's not a problem. With dependent type, I remember that with this implementation phi, I was in state C. And with this implementation phi, I was in state C prime, and then C second. Now with a different implementation psi, I, I mean K. And so with dependent types, it's all well typed. So uh, you can forget the intermediate thing if you, don't, if you are analog word typing. But it all makes sense. Here it means that now we have a migration tower. If I care about this program at this level U that I specified I, I care about, well, while it's running, I can migrate from this tower to that tower while it's running. So I can change the implementation strategy. So once again, from one machine to the other. I can also change the labels from my abstract graph in, into memory. That's garbage collection. I can also say, here's uh, one terabyte of data on disk or in memory. I can reinterpret it in a different way so that without having to copy a single bit, I can uh, change my system in interesting ways. So I can have zero, zero copy routing or zero copy whatever. I can dynamically reconfigure my, my program. I can say, well, this program is outputting frames uh, to, to the display. I can say the display is here, now it's there, now it's somewhere else, without recompiling my program, without stopping it, just by changing the, the environment. I can also say my, 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 my functions here, they are interpreted by source code, here as bytecode, here as native code, here as native code optimized. While the program is running, I can JIT everything. And say, hey, all these things have been done before. Yes, each and every of these things has been done before in a, spe a specific setting uh, that doesn't port to other settings. I'm offering you a general framework whereby you can write these things in a general way and compose them. So you can think about their correctness. You can optimize at runtime because now, oh, I have dynamic reconfiguration and I can recompile and, and decompile and recompile so I can optimize at runtime. I can retroactively add type, type travel debugging. Hey, when I get this message, something funky happens. I want to understand it. OK, next time I get this message, enter uh, time travel debugging, record everything, and then resume the program as normal. You can compose these things. And you have this predictable cost reduction because if your program is going to be long-lived and have any useful state in it, then and your machine is not uh, in, uh, immortal, which no machine is, Sooner or later, you will have to pay a few billions of dollars to IBM to migrate your system, and the migration will probably fail because most migrations fail. So I've been there before. You can see that I'm a bit bitter about it. Um, so yes, if migration of code and data is deep into your system, you will save a lot of money down the line if your, program, uh, if your company is successful. Requirement. Well, the main requirement here is full abstraction. It means that every computation must have a very clear abstract bottom. It's very clear what the bottom is. The virtual machine say, here's the, the, the thing I'm interested in, the, the level U that I'm interested in. And the bottom is totally opaque. You can't see below. If you can try to see, hey, am I on big Indian or little Indian? Well, I'm maybe I can give you an answer, but it's not deterministic. Today, you're little Indian. No promise. To, to do, tomorrow, you may be big Indian. And if you really care about one or the other, you must specify a lower level of abstraction for your thing. You must ma ma make it part of your specification of what you care about. If you care about it, tell me. If you don't tell me, it may change. 
Migration control. Who controls now what migrates or who migrates what? Well, some people want to control themselves when they migrate. So the, the, it's an internal it's part of your program where some part, some part of the program is implemented at some level and other, another part, part of the program controls it. Or you make, make it intern, external. And one man's internal is another man's external. And I have a whole part of my thesis that I'm not discussing today about an architecture for migration control. But uh, category theory, you have uh, just a few minutes. So uh, what is a natural transformation? When you as, as show a category to get someone, you say, OK, what is your natural transformation? Well, my natural transformations are almost code instrumentations. They are actually the opposite of code instrumentation. Code instrumentation is adding tracing or omniscient debugging or data coverage or parallelization or orthogonal processing, adding some aspect of computation to your program. So since you're adding an aspect, it will do more things. And, and since when you're adding an aspect, you can do it in many ways, uh, there it, it's not usually a natural transformation. A natural transformation being a total function has to lose information, you cannot add information. So if you're going to add information, obviously it's not a transformation, natural transformation. But if you're going to forget, to forget all these data, that, all these aspects that you, you bring, this is a natural transformation. A natural transformation is the opposite or dual of, uh, uh, so it's a, it's a dual of a code instrumentation. And like code instrumentation are themselves operations on implementations that are the dual of an abstraction. So I have lots of duality and opposites here, yes. Uh, are they then forgetful functors? Yes, they are forgetful functors. And uh, I'm sure you can write an adjunction diagram somewhere, but it's, it's more complex than just going up and down. It's, it need, you need some other data here, the data with which I'm going to annotate my program, and then I have some functor from this pair to the, to the, to the transform thing, and when I forget the transformation, I go back to the untransformed thing. Okay, so I have lots of reflective architecture thing I will not, oh, I will just show you one slide. Uh, now I can do uh, effects just like in uh, Haskell F uh, extensible effects, except that the effect will be handled by the controller program. So we'll have a controller meta program in the, in, in the background that will control your program in the foreground. And how it interprets the effect will be interpreted not by a handler in your program, but by a handler outside your program. And that's how you can say, hey, I'm going to display this uh, this presentation here or there, and your program does not have to care. Just say output frame, output frame, output frame. It doesn't even have to care that I'm going back in time and, and, and scrolling uh, in my frames uh, with a replay things. Your, your program just output frame, output frame, output frame, and the effects are handled outside. And yes, it looks very much like uh, effect handling, but outside the program instead of inside the program. Okay. Um, Lots of slides that I don't have time to, to discuss. Take home points. I'm going to reason about implementations with category theory. And the key concept, underrated concept, is observability, safe points that allows you to go up the semantic tower. Uh oh. Uh, I can extract my protocol uh, for first test implementations via extraction, and then I can explore the semantic tower at runtime. I have principal ap uh, applications which are migration and other, other things, and I also have natural transformations that gen generalize code instrumentation. And what uh, doesn't show because I edited my slide at the last minute is that in the end, I am reconciling runtime reflection and static semantics. You can and should and will have both. And if you implement your language the correct way, which you should, at the price of just maintaining this observability property, do not, not forgetting the interpretation function and um, observability, yeah, and maintaining this uh, full abstraction at all times, then you get, so it's a cost, you, you have to pay that price. But if you pay that price, you have a new world that opens before you of runtime reflection and static semantics together. Uh, challenge protecting your platform. And once again, if you're writing a program, your program is a language, so you want that already. You want to factor your software at meta levels and enjoy that. The meta story is that my contribution is mostly not technical. I don't have unhappily any line of working code to show you. My contribution is a change of point of view about computing. And I'm trying to change your brains today and hack you. And uh, hopefully it works. And this is about the essence of FP, going relating the abstract and the concrete and having the computation follow the reasoning and both together. This is the essence of FP. 
That's why I'm proud to present this today at LambdaConf 2018. Thank you. And my blog, uh, the URL doesn't show, but uh, if you Google for Winem Computing, you'll find it. We have five minutes for questions. <coughs> Yes. Yes, and this cost is already paid by anyone who has a garbage collected language. Because to do garbage collection, what do you do? Uh, garbage collection is migration. What you do is you interrupt your program, you synchronize it to a safe point. The word safe point, I am stealing it from the vocabulary of garbage collection. And at the safe point, then you can observe the heap because the invariants of the heap are not broken anymore. And then you can do all your rejiggering and your relabeling of heap objects. So if you, if you are have a garbage collected language, you're already paying the price of uh, safe points. And now in safe point, instead of taking just a flag, am I garbage collecting, am I garbage collecting, am I garbage collecting, you can say, am I garbage collecting or otherwise observing the program? And if you are, then go to the next level and go to as many levels that you need using observability. So you're already paying the price if you're using a garbage collected language. If you're using APL or, <laughs> or Rust, or, or C or C++, maybe you're not paying the price. But if you're using Haskell or Lisp or ML or any functional language, except Rust or APL, okay, um, then you're already paying the price. So why not have observability for free at runtime? It's not free at compile time. At compile time, you need to maintain all this extra information. Yes? Yes, except Alan K does not take uh, formal semantics seriously enough, but yes. Sure. So, what would you, okay, what, besides the, using a language that can do three? Yes. Which is kind of a language, right? Yes. Yes. At this point, just a language. Yes. Um, what does this bring us? Because basically, we could just get back to using Smalltalk and we have the full control. You, you can reason about your program that compiles time and know exactly what your program may or may not do. Uh, you, what I'm doing is I'm giving you an interface between the abstract above and the concrete below. And you, I can, you can give static semantics about the, uh, and reasoning about your program above that you care about and have total control at runtime over what's below. And the two are not, uh, are not in contradiction because I have set this full abstraction. The, 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 the full abstraction is what gives you the interface between what's above and what's below, and it's an essential concept there. And I, 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 can, I, can, I, I can have the best of both worlds. I, <coughs> I'm offering the best of both worlds. So yes, the world of Alan Kay and the world of uh, Philip Wadler at the same time. <laughs> Interesting crossover. Yes, the, the greatest crossover in, in the universe. <laughs> yes? Um, so in your Rust example, Yes. Language you're saying, couldn't you sort of interpret it as sort of some of these extra annotations that you that you are adding yes. on the sort of the yes uh, the for natural transformations level, right? yes you're adding these sort of yes. borrowing ownership sort of notation yes. isn't that in essence you're kind of hard coding in the the, the, the implementation observability into so the implementation knows oh, okay I can get rid of this yes as opposed to having to figure it out. It sort of, you, you give it more information, right? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean, but yes, you have to remember, when you compile, you have to keep all the information around so that you may decompile and... Uh, and these not lifetime notations are, 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 are exist for the implementation, not for the, not for the abstract. Yes, a, right? yes. A, for the implementation to be able to take care of memory for me. Yes, so your implementation indeed, this is information that Okay, you have the abstract computation, the concrete computation, and in this implementation, and now this implementation needs to be in a way reversible at runtime. And uh, the abstract doesn't care, uh, the system doesn't care, for, uh, but it, doesn't, it can afford not to care precisely because your implementation remembers this information so it can go back to the abstract. Right, because I've given it. Yes. So, so you, you, you're, yes. Yes. It's, it is an example of this kind of spin on it, right? Yeah. I mean, it is an example. Sort of I'm not sure I understand the nuances of your question. So next, maybe we can, we can talk later. Uh, of uh, yes. Um, oh, oh no, note: 
Uh, there is a paper by, don't remember which uh, usual category series has color about ornaments, uh, which corresponds a bit to my natural transformation. I don't remember the name of it. Are you aware of the work that uh, Martin took two months ago at the National? What? Where? Uh, what? The National. Don't know that. Okay, sure. Okay, and there, is a, there was a, somebody presenting to the Platinum Tower of Interpretation. Oh, yes. I mean, I mean, Romph. Beautiful, beautiful paper. Yes, I, I recommend it very, very much. Uh, yes, they're also collapsing Tower of Semantics using partial yeah, evaluation. It's v it, there are lots of similarities and differences, and uh, uh, maybe too many s to discuss right here. But yes, it's an excellent paper. I recommend. Uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're really working on the same. Yes, sa sa same general thing. Uh, I love what they do, Rump and I mean, or to sum up. Collapsing towers of interpretation or something? Yes. Uh, I can send the link on the uh, Yes, yes. It's a beautiful paper, I recommend it to everyone. Uh, although there are lots of things I don't like about it, but it uh, doesn't matter, it's still a beautiful paper. Amin and Ram. Amin and Ram. Yes, Nada Amin. She's now in Cambridge. They were both in, uh, I think, in Lausanne, but now they have moved. Yes? No. No question. No question. You understood everything? You're going to implement that in your next system? Thank you! Thank you.